care less. Yet many of us live carelessly before God. And the testimony is, we could care less. We don't care. Don't make him reach into his quiver of means and pull out severity and harshness to change us. Perhaps this is an opportunity to sober us now. Maybe we feel a little quiver in the seismograph of our own spiritual being and we know we're failing. We're failing. But it need not be so. Persecution. In that regard, our scripture this morning, it's a sad thing how we take each other for granted. Now, sometimes we baby. We do baby sometimes. We just, we have this tendency, men and women, to mother. Pastors mother too much. But we have so many people, frankly, that are struggling. Are you struggling because it's necessary? Or are there are reasons contributing to the fact that you're flailing you're flailing in the water and there seems to be boots full of water or quicks or sand or dirt or whatever or shackles chaining your feet and it's pulling you under. But how have you contributed to that? Have you gotten careless about fellowship? Think of Jesus Christ. How lonely it was at the cross. How lonely it was at the cross for us. Three days in the tomb. He paid the penalty for us. It was severe. Think how costly <clears throat> you and I are. And we don't love him as we love him in return. Think of how he has patience with us now. Patience with us now. And yet we care so little. Don't tell me that there is care for him when we are consciously as careless as regards him as we are. What about togetherness? This is a rich room. We have probably in this room without trying, probably right now, probably 20 nationalities in our small group here. It's a lot of love in our church. A lot of challenges and problems too, because we're not all the same. We're just not quite all the same. But it's wonderful. Sometimes we step on each other's toes, though. We can't quite get it. We think, oh, I, I don't need that guy. I don't need this, these people. I can get along. But the truth is, we do need each other. We're different. Some of us like different foods than the others like. Some of us make mistakes and speak languages in the presence of others who have no hope of knowing that language. We speak our own language. We're not considered. We're not thoughtful. Sometimes some of our people get run over. I know a couple of people that left our church in the last years. Because they couldn't quite fit in because I watched it from a distance. And they were being rolled over just by personality, by the power of another culture, let's say. You know what? None of that would be part of heaven. But you and I with our differences, while I will have so much in common in heaven, differences will mean nothing. I think of our church and how rich an experience it is, but we take it for granted, even when we're together. <clears throat> we forget that this could be the last time that we're together as this group. If we have a hundred and say ten people in this room, maybe right now, counting the kids that left, will we ever be together the same like this again? Will God ever give us that chance again? 
Is it meaningless anyways? Would you know that our scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, on our paper, it's the first word written under those lines, together. Verse 5 says, together. What does Ephesians 2, verse 5 say? Even when we were dead in sins, hath made us alive, or quickened to us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. Whatever that verse is saying is, is that we, and our experience in resurrection is so like that of Christ that our attachment or union with Him by us as though we were there and we were going through that together. There's a lot of emphasis in Scripture together. The Lord's table is something we observe with others. Individually, it's important in our faith. Yes, we make the decision to be saved, uh, to receive Christ, and it's an individual decision. There is no grandfather clause. There is no mama or dad clause. It is we ourselves who says, finally, yes, God, I do believe. <laughs> Verse 5 says, together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. The next verse, verse 6 says, And hath raised up, us up together. Notice the word, together. Verse 5 says, together. Verse 6 says, together. And it says in the next line, And made us sit together. Three times in about a verse and a half, the thought, together. Forgive me for thinking that there's at least a little significance in association. What a privilege it is that God would be associated with us. Now, he might well have saved us and died on the cross for us, risen from the dead, returned to heaven, and had nothing to do with us after that. But the Bible says his desire is for us. Our sins prevent that. But his desire, did you know that God's not in love with dying for our sin. But God's in love with us, John 3, 16. And so that sin, he died for our sin. He didn't love dying for our sin. That's not what he's about. He's about loving his creation and loving us. Together, he wants to be together with us. And his care is personal and intimate. And together means something. Together means something. When we're together like this in a congregation, con, in many languages, means with. The joy God has as his own gather is important to God. That's what we say. He is in the midst of them. And there is value despite our love or our passion for individuality. There is a passion on God's part that we come to Him and are in His presence. And when we care little or not at all for Him and being deliberately in His presence with others who have the same desire, oh, how much grief we must cause Him. How about our Bibles? I've been here 23 years. You don't know how it bothers me. How I'd just love to get rid of all these pew Bibles. But my people don't love their Bible. And they allow it to not only just get out of their reach, but they get so far. Oh, maybe they got a Kindle or something. Yeah, they're carrying it on. <laughs> they got something. Hey, they got an iPod. They got something. Maybe they got it orally. Fool me, tell me, hey pastor, offer me some reassurance. But how is it that God's people don't carry God's word with them? The Jews put, serious, some serious Jews put at the lintels, part of the doorway of their house, a little piece of scripture. All right, it's all works. I'll tell you what, though, 2010, I'm... I'm just ready to really honor and salute anybody who has any respect for the Bible anymore because it's a rarity. 
If you love God, you'll want to be with Him. Together, together, together. If you love His Word, you'll not be far away from it. When I used to take my kids to the beach, I hate the beach. I hate the sand. You probably expected that, but I do. But when I used to take groups from the church there, I'd take our cooler. I'd sit on the cooler and Yes, they were pretty well safe. There were other parents there too. But I would mostly be reading my Bible. I'd have a Bible near me, I know that. And I wouldn't take usually my home home Bible because I wouldn't want to get sand at the ask for the stuff. I'd have God's Word close by me. You keep a you have a car? Where do you keep your Bible? You keep it so it's sort of blanching and and fading away the sun in the back window in your car? Or do you keep it up close so that while you're waiting for the wife to, to, to go shopping and you're sleeping in the car, you can reach out and open your little New Testament the Bible and read God's Word? Amen. Carelessness as regards God's Word means I could care less about God's Word. And what if He should decide at some point they don't love my word. They don't appreciate my word. Let's try something else. Let's try removing the word and see if they will appreciate it. Do we live in a way defiant of God? And sometimes we do that as believers. We get really careless personally. Might God not say, my son needs to learn a little bit of a lesson here. I'll take from his health. And I will take from him that perhaps he might learn something about me. Does he, does she not use her money to bring me glory? Will she, will he use mammon utterly for him or herself without regard to me? It's not working. I'll take it. How many opportunities or choices or jobs even have been denied us by God? He's behind it. Because we have been careless with the little things we've had so far. And we have shown ourselves untrustworthy, not worthy of trust. And in his love for us, hopefully he has tenderly removed these things, maybe only temporarily. To get our attention. Because it is not just myself that's important. It's not just you who are important. It is he who is important and together. You notice at the end of the chapter 2 of the book of Acts, the communal care, the personal care, the sacrificial care. Study the life in the book of Acts of Barnabas partnered for a while with Paul. Wow. Who was sharing with me? Oh, the thought was, have you ever heard of being a prayer warrior? Yeah, I was in a, in a portion of our prayer meeting last week. Some teaching. It suggested the thought of how many of us would like to improve in our prayer lives and maybe become a prayer warrior. But I have never thought of anybody claiming, and I've never heard of it, claiming to be a giving warrior. You see, giving involves usually money. But prayer doesn't necessarily involve money. And money is rather dear to my heart. If I've got to choose between the two, I want to be a prayer warrior, Pastor Rose. <laughs> Little knowing that under God our prayers should, yes, deteriorate. Finally, into part of the fulfillment of that prayer, sometimes by our money. <coughs> but we don't learn those lessons. Those things are not appropriate or, or acceptable, at least in our own mind. And so God decides, I can't trust her. I can't trust her. Some of us are careless. Some of us have been raised with the thought, Almost all of our young lives have. God has a special one for us. 
God has someone special for us. And we prayed and waited and waited and prayed. But then we stopped praying. God can answer our prayer, fooling around and careless about our lives before Him. Where are these special ones? These choices, these decisions. When we make so many wrong decisions, and we do them without referring to the Word or getting other Christians' advice, when we don't adhere to the, what the Word says, can we expect His blessing? When we compromise in this or that, can we still expect the best that He's always offered us? Together! Hey, listen. We are meant to be together. The loss of any single one of us makes a difference. And your life in Christ matters. The Bible speaks of how we are all parts in essence really of a body. And every part and every part that we have has an essentialness to it. It's all together. It doesn't work. And yet many of us never show up. There are huge obstacles to many of us to make other meetings sometimes of our church. But let me say this. Sometimes we're just so careless and insulting to God. Our tardiness sometimes. It's because we're tardy and careless and could care less. Shame on us. If such a thing as a laxity by way of our timeliness in honoring God by coming into His presence with others, repeated again and again, betrays our perception of Him. Couldn't we see how He's worked according to the Word in the past? Carelessness does not pay. Carelessness regarding God returns upon us. A boomerang almost always to our harm. <coughs> Thank God he's merciful. Together. Now, verse 6 has a positive mention. Emphasis. It says, God, that's the who there in the first line of verse 6. And hath raised us up together. You know what? We've been preaching about grace and God's goodness. But really, the whole thing could be different. What instead of having raised us up, God had lowered us down? Did he ever have that as an option? Could that have been his choice? Could that be our end instead of feeling and enjoying the grace and the mercy of God and his having raised us up, he had treated us like we deserved and like we had treated him. 